Hello and welcome to today's webinar. It is part two of our three-part webinar series on government support for community composting. This one focuses on food scrap collectors and composters who have municipal contracts. So um, everybody is in listen-only mode. Um, if you have questions as we go, please type them into your GoToWebinar control panel under questions or chat, and we will get to them at the end of the, um, of, the end of our panelist. So uh, let me just say a few words. Uh, well, first, let me introduce my staff today. So today uh, at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, um, we have Clarissa Libertelli and myself. It's actually, you can see us, but it's shown on the next slide as well. And Clarissa is the a uh, newly hired coordinator for the Community Composter Coalition. That's the, what the CCC stands for. Um, thanks, Clarissa, for helping us with the registration and all things tech today. Much appreciated. I want to say a word about our sponsors. Big shout out to all of our grant funders, even those of you who don't like to be mentioned, but 11th Hour Project is one that does. So thanks to 11th Hour Project, big funder of our Composting for Community initiative here at ILSR. And Biobag, a shout out, has been helping us with anybody who wanted to attend to get them registered and offering scholarships. So thanks, uh, I said BioCycle. BioCycle is always a big help. Thank you, Nora, but this is Biobag that's helping us with the scholarships today. So thanks to Bio, uh, Biobag. Um, as I mentioned, this is uh, the second part in a three-part series. Uh, the first part, I'm putting the links into the chat, is part one. There's a recording on the spotlight on New York City. And part three is coming up later this month. And it's going to feature local government speaking about the partnerships they have uh, with the public and private sector. So uh, if you haven't registered for that, please do. And we're just going to start with a poll to see who's participating today. So Clarissa is going to help me with that. And the choices are, I know we asked you um, about that when you registered, but we just so everybody can see who's joining today. So select, you may fit in, into more than one of these options. Just select the best option. Are you a community composter? Do you consider yourselves more of a food scrap collection service provider? Are you a local government? Are you with state or federal government? Or are you other? The other, when you guys registered, we had quite a range. We had a zoo, we had other composters, we had some farmers, we had some researchers. So that was a wide range under other. So just select what's best for you and we will show the results. So all right, love to see that we have 44% of you um, local government, welcome. Uh, state and federal government, welcome to. Everybody is welcome at today's webinar. Um, we are thrilled that you are participating. All right, so now let me introduce um, our panel today. And uh, we are joined by Jeremy Brzezowski at Compost Cab based in Washington, D.C., uh, Andrew Rousseau from Black Earth Compost in Massachusetts, Eileen Benaira from the Community Compost Company that operates in New York and New Jersey, Ben Perry, Compost Crew in Maryland, and Justin Garrity, Veteran Compost, also in Maryland. Before I give uh, bios, let me just give a few words about our community, before we get into the panel discussions, a few words about our composting for community work and how we're cultivating community composting. Just want to share that we have a community composter coalition. I mentioned Clarissa is the coordinator, uh, but we offer forums, workshops, webinars like this. We have a podcast. Uh, we have a coalition. If you're a member, um, you have to be an organized, uh, actually an organization that's already started, not an individual to join the coalition, but we have a Google group for that. We're producing guides. Our guide that's coming out next is called Oh Rats, a guide to avoid rodent problems at community compost sites. But we also have policy resources. We do training. We have some videos. So please uh, check out our, our website. Um, as the next slide shows, uh, this is uh, just a um, kind of a sampling of some of the many webinars. Most of these are available for free, the recordings, uh, but they range uh, from bike powered food scrap collection. We did a whole series last year on on-farm composting and compost use. Uh, another one was just on the climate connections with compost. So check those out at your leisure. 
Uh, we do do, uh, we have a new online training program for community composters called Community Composting 101. It's a self-paced course uh, with knowledge checks as you go. And uh, at the end, you get a certificate. It doesn't replace hands-on training, but one thing I'll just say that no matter what scale compost sites operate at, one of the most important facets of a successful site is a trained operator. So if you're a home composter, a community scale, or a farmer, whatever scale, I hope you will get some training. There's lots of good programs out there. One of the things we've been doing in our team is producing um, graphics. And I think the next slide shows this. I know it's hard to read. You'll have to go to the website. But this is a graphic we just released during International Compost Awareness Week uh, called How Composting Combats the Climate Crisis. And it goes through um, a number of strategies for that. So check that out. We'd love if you could help us push us push that out in the world. And a graphic that we've done that's been around for a number of years is really relevant to today's conversation. This is our hierarchy to reduce waste and grow community. And I think it's the only hierarchy that has the lens of local and size as part of looking at what should be pr prioritized or most preferred. So at the top, we have like EPAs, preventing waste, rescuing edible food, but then we have home composting. And where that arrow is pointing is towards small scale decentralized sites. And then you have more medium scale locally based. So we're really operating in that space with this series today, focusing on that is that how can local government support small scale, decentralized, medium scale, locally based operators? Um, and so that's a good segue into our panel today. Um, and we did the poll already, so we'll just skip that. <laughs> and um, as Clarissa is bringing up Jeremy's slides, let me just introduce Jeremy Brzezowski, who I've known for a number of years. And he started, uh, he's the founder and CEO of Compost Cab, a company started in 2010. Uh, Compost Cab and Jeremy himself has been an inspiration for many food scrap collection service providers. May maybe some of you on the line today have been inspired by Compost Cab. And the company today's, today provides residential and commercial pickup service for food scraps. Jeremy operates one of the largest farmer farmers markets food scrap collection programs in North America, and he's doing that under contract with the DC Department of Public Works. So Jeremy, thanks for joining us. The mic is yours. Excellent, thank you so much, Brenda. It is, I was, uh, I was telling my kids last night in advance of this panel, how incredibly lucky I feel to have the opportunity to to talk to this group today, when you were nice enough to share with uh, with me and the rest of the panel, kind of the list of attendees, it feels like a gathering of old friends in a lot of ways, or and certainly fellow travelers. And so, um, each of us individually uh, is working on our particular businesses and our in our particular cities and with our particular challenges. But in aggregate, um, our numbers are actually quite strong. And so, before I kick off with my deck, I'd be really I'd be remiss if I didn't take an opportunity on behalf of I'm going to do it on behalf of everybody on the panel and if they can they can retake they can take it back if they want but I want to just thank Brenda and the team at ILSR for their longtime leadership in um, in advocating fiercely on the on behalf of composting in general and community composting in particular uh, and with that I am excited to jump into our little presentation thank you very much I'm just going to set my timer so I don't go long Okay, I'll take the next slide, slide please. Um, so this is a brief history of Compost Cab. You can come back to it if you choose to look at the slides later on. Uh, we are celebrating 12 plus years in business. Uh, I had the idea for Compost Cab in the back of a greenhouse in, at a place called Growing Power uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I had been inspired by the possibilities of urban agriculture. Um, and that idea was in March of 2010, and that September we did our first residential pickups, and that's where it started. Um, and we have grown slowly and steadily from there, and we have seen, I think much more importantly, we have seen the movement grow along with us. And so in aggregate, I look at the 
you know, everyone who's on this call and all the municipalities who are considering how to make community composting part of their mix uh, on the sustainability front going forward, this feels, you know, more germane than ever and is exactly in line where we hoped where things would be when we got started. Uh, we just wish it had taken a little bit less time, but it is extraordinarily, it feels like we we're at an extraordinary uh, moment. So next slide, please. So, I think it's important to keep in mind, in mind that composting is in context in, in general, but especially when it comes to working with municipalities. There are, um, and I'm going to speak mostly about larger municipalities. DC is a city with 700,000 people. The city of Alexandria, which is our other big community, um, municipal partner, has about 40,000 people, I believe, um, but it's adjacent to um, the district. And it is, um, you know, there are a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that need to be balanced. And so the real question isn't, you know, is composting coming? I think everybody is in agreement that organics recycling is coming, certainly on the coast, but probably on a nationwide basis, which is why we're all here and we're so excited. But the real question is, what's it going to look like? Or the ones that we hear is, what's it going to look like? Who's going to benefit? How does that hit us hit our larger climate goals? And then, of course, what's it going to cost? And so in our universe composting is exclusively about composting um but for our counterparts on in the government our experience has been that they are juggling a lot of things and this can only be a partial priority and we'll talk a little bit about how we can help um service them as part of you know the process next slide please so community programs work um, we have seen it happen. Um, at, we, we just wound up our first five-year contract with the District of Columbia running a food scrap drop-off program in all eight wards of the city. Uh, we had that contract renewed in April for another five years. Uh, it is a, you know, when all is said and done, it will be somewhere in the neighborhood of a $1.8 to $2 million contract. It is the biggest thing that the district is currently doing on organics recycling, but it's also a drop in the bucket relative to the totality of the waste stream and the totality of the DPW budget. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but the fact that they chose to lead with a community-based and visible program um, was very much in line with our mission orientation from the very beginning. And so we were very happy to help design this program for DPW back in 2017 to run it for the past five years and, uh, and look forward to running it uh, for the next five. Um, with the community in mind. Next slide, please. So this is what it looks like. We pop up a tent like this in somewhere between eight and 12 locations, Saturday, Sunday, week in, week out, rain, shine, hail, you name it. If markets open and farmers are there, we are there. Um, it is a ballet because it all happens in motion and you can't leave anything on site. So in this particular drop-off scenario, it's not permanent locations. We're going where the people are, uh, not forcing people to come to us. Uh, and in doing so, we have to be very nimble. And so the way it works is on a, uh, we gear up a series of sprinter style vans on Friday, Saturday morning, everybody hits the road. We have drivers that are out with bins and tents and all the gear that we need. They are met at market by our uh, our market team they the market team sets up the tent they staff it the whole bit and over the course of any given weekend now um, in the space of 36 hours we'll see somewhere between you know 3,000 and 3,500 people across dc and alexandria drop somewhere between 10 and 12 tons of compost every weekend and that's a number that continues to grow uh, next slide please so that gives you a sense as to kind of what the program has looked like over the course of the last five years. Uh, we don't have 2022 on here, but it's trending up about 25 to 30%. Uh, this, by the way, is through COVID. And despite the fact that uh, at some point in 2020, the city um, inadvertently in the kind of COVID shutdown chaos um, tried to shut down the program. And we were successful in being able to defend that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the how we can help ourselves section of this deck. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, it takes, it, the thing that I love about this program, like you stand at the DuPont Circle Farmer's Market and you watch people come up to these tents and it looks like the city. It is completely non-denominational. It is totally egalitarian. It takes all shapes, sizes, colors, you name it. 
it is the most normal thing and it's very, very visible. So we saw 440,000 people come to our tents over the course of the last five years, but we're not talking at all about the number of impressions of seeing this tent up on the roadside with every car coming by over time. Like we're in the business of helping change behavior. Um, and at the end of the day, composting is the last line of defense on food waste, but it's the tip of the spear on behavioral change. And that's really our approach. And we have found that municipalities um, like and respect that in part because, you know, if you look at Brenda's hierarchy, the stuff at the top is reduction. And so that has to be our, our approach. It's always reduce first, reuse when possible, organics recycle when you can. Um, so next slide, please. So how can municipalities support community composting? Uh, well, I, I, there are all sorts of ways, um, but here are four that are top of mind for me. One is when you do your procurement, you have the opportunity to make choices and to make, um, cho and to make priorities um, and missions visible. Uh, one way to do that is to have programs that are pre-created that enable small local businesses to have preferential treatment in the procurement process. Um, we have been the beneficiary of that in the district over time, not just with this business, this is my, you know, the third company that I've run over time. And in all cases, we have worked very closely with government because, well, there is nothing like the power of government when it's behind you to get stuff done. Doesn't mean bureaucracies can't be difficult to work through, but at the end of the day, um, it is, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like the power of the mayor sending out a tweet saying, go do this. Um, it's really quite something. And so when you do procurement as a municipality, you have an opportunity to make your values clear, um, set up systems that prefer small and local businesses. Uh, when you think about building out your composting programs, prioritize programming and education and outreach and not just collection and not just processing. Infrastructure is great, but infrastructure without programming, infrastructure without participation isn't really going to get us what we need. And that is, it is very hard, we have seen over time, it is harder to procure against something as um, intangible as programming, whereas X number of cans per week collected or X number of tons processed is very easy, relatively speaking, to procure. Uh, but if municipalities prioritize or at least bind together the programming po component and the logistical component, they can create an environment where behavioral change and building a more sustainable citizenry can really thrive. Um, related to that, we ask for clear and predictable communication. Um, as we've been building our business over time, the district has been our largest and best client, and in some ways are one of our biggest challenges. And, and it comes from uh, aspirations. Uh, it has been years of, of talk over time about allocating a real budget to doing curbside, which would obviously have a meaningful impact on our existing business and has certainly influenced how we've chosen to invest our resources over time. Um, but we've been doing this now 12 years and we still haven't seen curbside happen. But and we're gonna talk about how we can help ourselves in a minute. It's coming and it's coming in large part because of the work that we've done and our partners have done and our collaborators and our peers have done. Have done. Finally, um, I ask municipalities to accelerate the pace of regulatory adoption. Like we all know where this is headed, right? It's not a mystery. There's basically the California model. There's the West, the, the, the West Coast, you know, the Pacific Northwest model. We're seeing how things are evolving in New England. Most municipalities are not going to go try to, or shouldn't at least, be trying to rewrite the, the you know, everything from scratch. We have models that we know work, and we know that they're coming. And the way we can accelerate the pace of regulatory adoption is by laying down markers resisting the the pushes that invariably come against anything that costs money and then importantly next slide please you got to make the pie bigger right at the end of the day if we want to see the things that we want to see grow it can't be in 50 and 100,000 dollar blocks it's not big enough and it is and more money doesn't necessarily mean larger facilities. More money doesn't necessarily mean um, you know, larger fleets. It means um, greater participation rates, more source reduction. All of these things come together. And if and, and we vote with our dollars. And so when it comes to budget season, um, money is what talks. 
So here in DC, I'm very proud to say there has been an allocation made for the fiscal 23 budget of 4.1, I wanna say 4.3 million dollars um, to do a 10,000 person curbside pilot. Um, we don't know what it's gonna look like, but we know that it's progress. And if it sticks, um, it will be a meaningful, it, it, it will mean a meaningful additional investment um, on the part of the community. And if you're doing good work, Next slide, please. All right. Jeremy, We're, just I'm 30 wrapping more, up. 30, 30 more, seconds. more seconds. I'm wrapping up. I, thank you, Brenda. So we are at a crossroads as, as, an, as a, an industry and as a society when it comes to deciding how we want to do things in our cities. And municipalities have the op. We, we, we in the private sector can build all the infrastructure we can and we can do all the great work we want. But at the end of the day, we need your help. Next slide, please. And we promise that we will advocate fiercely. You know, we promise that we will cooperate amongst ourselves. Um, we promise that we will be a resource to you. Like we're experts. We do this all day and all night. Don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call. Like we're here to help, even if there isn't a procurement happening. We're citizens. We live here, we work here, and we want to see it be successful. And lastly, you know, I, I say it for ourselves, and I, you know, I, I see it, you know, amongst my peers on this panel. Like you have to be prepared to grow um and small scale and distributed doesn't mean small so anyway thank you everybody i'm very grateful for the chance to talk um and to see this group come together and again brenda thank you so much for making it happen oh, thank you and thank you for those excellent remarks and it's my fault i can't give these excellent speakers more time each that they all deserve but let's move on since we have four more panelists uh, let me introduce andrew Brousseau with black earth compost in Massachusetts. Sorry about that. It says MAC there on the slide. Uh, but Andrew is the compost manager at Black Earth Compost, founded in 2011. He joined Black Earth just as Massachusetts was implementing its ban on wasted food going to landfills and incinerators. And today, Andrew's going to share Black Earth's public-private partnership experience since they have several varying approaches uh, with several Massachusetts towns. So Andrew, the mic is yours. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a owner and managing partner of Black Earth Compost. Uh, we've been in business for 10 years. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm gonna just rip through what I have to talk about. So excuse me if it seems fast. So. We have three compost sites right now and about 30 collection trucks. They're out there. We pick up about 250 uh, tons per week of food scraps and we compost about half of that. We collect in about 80 towns and we sell compost in about 100 garden centers. Uh, we've been in business for 10 years and I think we've had success because uh, we focus on providing the service for the lowest cost possible. Um, we find that cost uh, is a barrier, and so we do everything we can to provide the lowest cost, not only to the towns, but also to the the residents and commercial locations. And you know, often uh, if you keep the cost low, then you won't be on the municipal chopping block. So. We've also been success, I think because Massachusetts is a little unique in that there's a lot of residential demand, but there's just not a lot of land. And composting is not lucrative. So like we can't compete with housing. Um, and I'll talk more about that. And yeah, there's just so much demand from housing and there's a lot of talk about affordable housing but there's not really talk about affordable commercial space or affordable industrial space. And, you know, Boston demands a lot of uh, residential for their like brain work jobs. Our next slide. All right, so I'm gonna talk about specific field notes that I have. Um, next slide, please. So from what I've learned over the last 10 years, first are notes for composters. And then next are notes for municipalities. So my first note for composters is, if you're trying to work with a municipality, they are slow. And it's by design, because they need to get all, um, you know, everyone's opinion in. So this is generally the uh, process, you know, DPW to town manager, 
that could take two years right there. Um, and then, you know, an RFP is issued and then you have a month to respond and then it goes to the board of select people and then you negotiate contract. That could take a year. So just know that it's a slow process. Some towns go fast, some are slow. Next slide. Um, there's a little delay, but so don't let municipalities get involved in the design of the facility. Uh, for example, we we worked with the town that the town got the grant to design the facility and then Black Earth operates it. The problem is, is if you're not under, under contract with them, then they have to design it with the idea that anyone could operate it. But because the, I think the composting infrastructure and it's in its nascency and the operators are few. And so you really need to design your facility uh, to fit you. And a town's not gonna know what you need or they can't take it into consideration completely because of uh, procurement laws. Next slide. Um, so consider the deep state. I didn't know what that was until recently, but it's basically the non-elected officials who have influence over the process. Um, you know, maybe the elected officials want you, but there's people who are generally salaried within the municipal organization who may not want you there. You know, maybe they're uh, mother lives next to the proposed compost site or something like that, you know, and they can slow you down either by not responding, taking a long time, raising the bar, like making it harder, you know, increasing specs for you to build to, all kinds of stuff. Building inspector, it could be anyone. And it can also help you because there can be people in the municipal organization who want you there. So just be aware that just because the mayor wants you doesn't mean you're gonna get there. Next slide. Um, so match your obligations contractual with the municipality. So like don't start being obligated to like pay them money or provide a service if you're waiting for like the building inspector to uh, allow you to build, you know, because they could drag that out for two years. Meanwhile, you're already paying to collect and you haven't, you don't even have a processing place yet. So consider that, um, like consider that with your contract, just like provide incentive to them. And finally, if you're really, if you're operating anywhere, like we can't own our own land because uh, composting is not lucrative. And we're going for a distributed model where there's compost sites all around the state. So we're not gonna own the land. So we are always guests and just remind everyone, all your employees, we are guests on the land that we are at. Uh, all right, next slide, going on to comments for municipalities. So protect your municipal land. Um, there, you know, your land is there to serve the people and once you start letting residential encroach, because residential will always encroach, once that starts happening, you're not gonna get your land back because the land value for residential is too high and that will never turn back into a forest or even commercial. Like residential is not going to commercial or industrial. It's staying residential because, you know, in Boston, there's a lot of brain work. So if you, next slide, here's just an example. Uh, this is a compost site that I was, uh, about to start and you, you can see it here. There's the compost site. Well, I don't see it yet. Um, can you go to the next slide and then the next one? So there's the compost site and then flip to the next satellite image, please. So, you know, I was about to start, I was about to get my permit and then I walked up on top of the leaf pile and then this area had been cleared and they're putting in residential there. And that's, and then the state DEP was like, we're not gonna permit that, it's too close to homes, new homes. So, you know, protect your land, your municipal land, it's there. And once you lose it, you know, your municipal land is there to serve 
your town for the next thousand years. So don't lose it. Next slide, please. Um, so when you do issue RFPs for collection services, leave it open for creative solutions that include in-town processing or aggregation. And don't be surprised if those solutions need to be regional. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, if you're gung ho for a facility, get your operator involved in the design phase. That's what I was saying earlier about just like, there's not a ton of operators. Um, so you want to design your facility around that. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So this is an example of a municipality out west that um, issued an RFP for collection service in 2020. And they wanted to do the processing facility too, but they didn't include it in the first RFP. So they got a collector. I think it was like waste management. You know, that's going to be expensive. And then their next RFP was for the site selection process. So that person couldn't really select the site, you know, to fit the operator because the operator hasn't even been selected. They're in the fourth RFP, which is like two years out. So then after that second RFP and the site was selected, they went to a third RFP to design an engineer. So they had to use a compost engineer. And how is that compost engineer going to, you know, match the facility to the operations of whoever's going to operate it. They can't because they don't know who it is. They're just drawing off of uh, what they know. And keep in mind that engineers are just trying to protect their ass because they put their stamp on that. So they're going to go above and beyond what's needed, whereas an operator can find synergies, you know, especially if they're the collector, collection people. So then the fourth RFP is to operate the facility. You know, it's already been built. You know, it's like, hey, who wants to come in and operate this thing? Well, good luck finding that for low cost um, because you went through this process backwards. So like if you want to save money and you want to, you know, if you want to save money and not have high operating costs, then, you know, find the synergies at the beginning of the process. Who is your collection person? Can they also operate? And like, what kind of synergies are there? You know, it's it can be like building design or like operating hours, just, just all kinds of things. You don't know. And this industry is so young and there's a lot of innovation that um, you just, you want to be open to those opportunities. Uh, I think next slide is my last one. I see you on there, Brenda. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe, I'll, all right, one more slide, because I'm done. But I just want to bring up this big picture stuff. Just remember what it is we're doing here. Organic waste management, the purpose is to recirculate nutrients back to grow new food, or really to replace fertilizer that's mined from rock. That's what we're recycling. So you got to keep that big picture in mind. Um, that's sustainability, and this graph shows how much phosphate rock we need to mine every year from around the globe. So we're globally dependent on that rock. And like, can we sustain that input year after year? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a sustainability question. And that's what organic waste management is trying to solve. Thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, appreciate that for folks who, 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 joined after we already started feel free to type your questions in at any time we will try to get to all of them when we get to the q a after everyone has spoken so let me introduce our next speaker eileen banaira from the community compost company who as i mentioned earlier is in new york and new jersey uh, eileen is the founder and president of this woman-owned business in the hudson valley founded in 2013. she's also a city planner by profession so she's been in local government and she's worked in the public and private sector doing land use and zoning so both rural areas and cities and she's going to share her experience winning contracts with the cities of hoboken and jersey city and hopefully a few other communities and one last thing on eileen she's currently serving on the board of the u.s composting council so eileen welcome the floor okay. is yours okay great thank you i don't have anything else to say since you said everything brenda so thank you um yeah so community compost company and we produce um 
we're both collection. You can go to the second slide. Uh, we both have a collection company. We do door-to-door uh, -door residential collection, commercial collection, as well as drop spots. We're a woman-owned business. Um, we also have our seal of testing assurance and NOFA certification for our composting products. Um, and we operate both, as Brenda indicated, both in New York State and in New Jersey. Uh, we're in the Hudson Valley, so we're, we pretty much stay in our uh, lane, um, and we're trying to do a regional approach to this. Next slide, please. Just a little bit of background, as Brenda indicated, I have over 30 years as an environmental planner, as a former planning director, and I've worked with all aspects of local government. Um, and our company really has a deep commitment. Why we started, uh, why I started this was uh, really my climate mitigation strategy. And um, what we have right now, what we're setting up are decentralized waste facilities and compost production. Uh, our feeling is that there's waste is everywhere. It should be processed locally. Um, I, we love ILSR's hierarchy because um, while the EPA gave a little bit more generic one, ILSR's hierarchy really gives the detail um, uh, regarding what, what we espouse, which is local and decentralized. So I think it really kind of nails that. Uh, we partner with public and private, and we're experts in do education, collection, and compost production. Uh, next slide, please. I'm just going to go through a few of our programs. Yeah, we do represent some big cities. We've had multi-year contracts, both with the city of Hoboken and with uh, Jersey City. But in Hoboken, um, we've been there since uh, 2015. I guess actually probably before that, but when we finally got started with our programs um, in Hoboken, it was 2015. And um, and I'm going to say Hoboken has evolved, and, and each community is a little bit different. So while all communities and everybody has a municipal government and people are people, they're really different per community and each community likes to do their own thing. Um, so what, what's happened in Hoboken, we, we started with a, a bike collection program. Uh, we had started with three drop spots at, uh, I'm gonna say key locations in the city. And we've evolved that to, you know, multiple drop spots around the city. Uh, door to door processing, municipal collection, some uh, waste collection for commercial as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Jersey City partnership again, multi year contract partnership began in 2016, started at farmers markets. Um, we have uh, drop off programs, which I'll, I'll go through a little bit more because I think drop off prog programs to me, particularly for um, uh, rural areas or I'm going to say suburban areas, I really feel very strongly that drop-off pro programs are the way to go. But also in Jersey City, they've really done a multi-layer uh, approach. They've started with a backyard composting of homeowners, and then they moved. We have um, municipal gardens that we're working. We've constructed a number of three bin composting systems in a multiple community gardens, and they also have a fairly extensive drop-off program. Next slide, please. Uh, North Bergen, Union City, and Secaucus. We're in all three of those cities also. Um, they started, most of them we start, we try them as a pilot program. We start with a pilot just so the community could get uh, introduced to the program. And also just, uh, I'm gonna say to, it really begins with a lot of uh, education. I think Jeremy kind of nailed that in his presentation, but it's a lot about behavior change. And without education, uh, you know, the compost, the compost drop spots or, or composting at all doesn't work. Um, and as Jeremy also talked about, it's taken a long time to grow. He started in 2010, and I'm sure when he started, nobody really knew what he was doing, which is what we found also while San Francisco and New York City, um, Boulder were doing programs. You know, when we started in the uh, New Jersey, uh, people were asking me why, why didn't I pay them for accepting their material and, and all kinds of things. Um, we've really seen a turnaround, I'm gonna say in the last few years, uh, mostly because I think EPA, uh, Natural Resource Defense Council, um, kissed the ground, there's been a lot of, a lot more uh, interest and um, media coverage of, of waste and how important it is. So we advise and consult our communities 
um, on uh, particularly these communities on drop spots. Um, we will do door to door in city areas. And what we often tell people is to find a community advocate in your community. There's typically someone in the community that is really wants to be the spokesperson, cheerleader, run around, greenie. And uh, I think it's important to find those people. Um, in New York State, next slide, please. Uh, we have a couple of uh, the, the programs that we run are at transfer stations um, in Ulster County. And we also, um, those programs began in 2014. We also have a number of private drop spots that we started on our own in areas that we thought would be good, like, uh, for example, Beacon and in uh, Kingston, New York. Um, we're also opening a processing site up in Columbia County, New York, uh, later on this year. So again, these programs are all depending upon your community, depending upon your elected officials and the public. Um, you know, public outreach is really important and public um, input is important. So your program may be different than your neighboring communities. Each program that we have, even with the ones in, um, I'm going to say Hudson County, New York, I know there's a few people on from New Jersey here. If you know Hudson County, those programs are all different and Hoboken and Jersey, Jersey City border each other. And I'm going to say they can't be diff more different in terms of how they approached it, how they deal with it. They both have uh, fairly extensive dropping uh, drop spot locations and with Hoboken probably being one of the densest in the country because we probably have 14 drop locations and it's a mile square city so it's kind of fun. Uh, next slide please. Um, a few successes uh, yeah the municipal drop-off programs why I said I want to touch that again um, you know our company feels fairly strongly about how important a municipal drop spot program is. Um, as Jeremy indicated in his presentation, you know, they're at the farmer's markets um, and we're at, in, in most of our locations, they're set by our cities. They've given us locations. We consulted with them and, and selected spots that we thought would actually be good locations um, based on interest that they sent out on surveys and things. But uh, certainly a farmer's market where people are coming anywhere anyway, they're not making a special trip to drop off a five gallon bucket of compost. That seems counterintuitive for all of us uh, environmentalists saying you're going to get in your car and drive your five gallon bucket somewhere. Um, we feel the same way uh, about doing door-to-door uh, -door in suburban communities. The houses are too far apart. And I think people lose the impact of carrying their bucket. Now, this sounds awful, but bear with me. Carrying your bucket and realizing, I can't tell you how many times we've been at a drop spot, particularly at the farmers, and hear somebody say, I can't believe how much food I wasted. Um, you know, when you take an, an uh, waste stream out and uh, parse them apart, you'll realize your food scraps are one your recycling is another and your garbage is, an, is another. When people actually make that connection, then it really does have, you really can see behavioral change. And I think that's super important. Um, the second thing that we found was people were like trying to see how much weight they could get in their bucket as if that was a good thing. Um, so the education component regarding, um, and this was EPA had a food too good to waste program. There's some really good handouts um, and um, menu planners that come out of the EPA. And, um, and we, we really feel it's important to tell people is plan your menu, pull the stuff out of the back of your fridge, use it uh, or lose it, meaning move it on to compost if, you've, if it's uh, expired as in it's bad. But I think it's really carrying that bucket or feeling what you've actually done and isolating it and seeing it has really made a huge impact that we think to uh, to people in, in our communities. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so uh, contracts. I think this is a little bit better. Um, contracts just, you know, this was about municipal contracts. So this is for composters and for municipalities. They're binding. Um, I've found that in uh, my municipalities that sometimes there's boilerplate language in there that really doesn't work for the composter. And it really doesn't work necessarily even for the municipality. Sometimes it's like, in an effort to get something done quickly. So uh, be careful of boilerplate uh, language. Make sure both you as the contractor 
or a composter and the municipality understand what actually is needed for, to make a successful program and make sure that's included in the contract. Um, starting a program, you have to know your town and state's requirements. There may be multiple permits or approvals depending upon what you're doing. Typically for collection, there there isn't, I'm going to say, but there may be if you're setting up a site, certainly zoning board of health, land use, DEC, permits, whatever. Um, I'll be almost done, Brenda. Um, I think it's also, it's really important to um, like start with small successes. Um, it's good to pilot a program, see what's working, it's not working. A big failure in composting could kill your program. So I like to tell my communities, I know you want to start giant, let's start small and we'll build it after we see what the issues are. Um, establishing clear contact points and be patient working through the process because um, being paid takes a long time sometimes with municipalities and um, and you know working through the whole process as uh, Jeremy had said, it takes a long time for a municipality to get this going. Um, composting is an emerging field, which we've all said right now. So know your subject matter if you're the composter and the municipality and be prepared to educate, 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 educate. ILSR, EPA, US Composting Council, all these people, BioCycle Connect is fabulous. Um, all of these areas are where you can get some more information. And, you know, and I think because you're on here, I'm going to say that you're now, you're a spokesperson in some way for whether you're doing organics collection, production, or, you know, you're just an interested community. So help us all build like a greater knowledge and acceptance. And I'm going to say work with passion, like the earth and our soils depend on it, because they do. And we're all responsible for the climate change that's happening. And this is a way to get there. So there's my contact information. And thank you, Brenda, again. As Jeremy said, you're a great resource to all of us. So thank you. Thanks, Eileen, and thanks yeah, for your no great remarks. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's move on. We have two more speakers. Uh, ben Perry is the CEO of Compost Crew, which was founded in 2011 in Maryland, but he's working not only in Maryland, but the District of Columbia in Virginia. And he took over as CEO in 2018. And uh, I'll just say uh, thousands of clients in his region now, but in last this year, I guess earlier in January, the U.S. Composting Council awarded Compost Crew its Organics Diversion Program of the Year Award. Congratulations, Ben. And Ben today will talk to us about his many municipal contracts. So the mic is yours, Ben, and welcome. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks to the ILSR team. And the nice work, Jeremy, Andrew, Eileen, with the informative presentations before me. So, as Brenda mentioned, Ben Parry, I'm the CEO of Compost Crew, and you can go on to the next slide. So, Compost Crew, similar to the other companies, we collect food waste from homes, businesses, and we have dozens of municipal contracts, both curbside collection and drop off programs. Um, we haul those the the food scraps that we collect either to our own compost facilities or we partner with facilities owned by county or or other private companies in the area. And our mission is to focus on building convenient and affordable composting services that are available to the mainstream. So we want to get composting from a niche offering to a to a mainstream offering, like Andrew said, that that everybody can afford. So go to the next slide. We've been around for 11 years, you know, partially, the, the original founders were partially inspired by, by Jeremy at Compost Cap and also ILSR for sure. We've grown mostly organically with, with one acquisition and we've diversified into both collections with all different types of customers, like I mentioned, and, and composting as well. And um, this, earlier this year, we raised our burst, our, our biggest um, equity financing so far, five and a half million dollar Series A, which is going to help us accelerate growth in the region and increase adoption of, of food waste recycling. Next. So we are a values driven business with the main goals to eliminate food waste and but also revitalize the health of, of the soil. Our legal status, we're a public benefit corporation. That's how we're registered. So we have a duty, not just to our shareholders, but also to the planet, to our workers and, and to the community. Next. 
And our primary focus is to build closed loop food waste recycling programs that keeps the food waste that we collect and the resulting soil amendment that the, the food waste turns into, into the same community. And we're specifically interested in working with table crop producers, table crop farmers, to demonstrate that closed loop model. So we collect food waste within 30 minutes of the farm, we haul it back to the farm, mix it with yard waste and other brown material, make very high quality soil amendment that can then be incorporated back into the farm soil to help them grow healthy food, which then gets sold back into the community. So that's the type of turnkey model where we're um, combining our food waste collections expertise, expertise with composting, distributed composting expertise, and building food waste recycling programs for municipalities and communities. Next. This is a case study of that distributed composting model in action. So this is located in, um, in Maryland, Montgomery County, Maryland. We collect food waste from various places in, in the county, from different communities, including the town where this farm is located. We take the, the food waste back to the farm, mix, mix it with brown material on a concrete pad, incorporate it into the, the aerated static piles, immediately and produce a high quality soil amendment that helps the farm reduce input costs, rising in input costs of, of fertilizers and other, other chemicals that they use. And, and it's applied to the soil, to the farm, according to the farm's nutrient management plan. And this is a modular system that can scale over time. So if we start a community food waste collection program, with just a few hundred households that grows over time, the composting at the farm can also grow in parallel. And this is all done in, in less than 5,000 square feet. There's no issues with, with leachate or other groundwater problems. There's no odor, there's no neighbor issues, even though there's um, residential homes right across the street. Next slide, please. So the previous case study was about how we integrate our, our collection service with on-farm composting. This is, now I'm gonna talk about a few case studies with just collections for municipalities. So what this is showing is the different types of municipal programs that, that we've established over the years. It ranges from curbside collection programs where the town or municipality is paying for everything, a curbside collection program where the town shares some of the fee with the residents, drop-off programs in which, you know, well, Eileen talked about those already and so did Jeremy, and then other neighborhood organized programs that have municipal support, but municipality doesn't pay for anything that the members of the community pay for the, the entire fee. And not surprisingly, the highest participation is the full subsidy curbside collection program, which is also the highest cost to the municipality because the municipality is paying the full fee. Whereas the drop-off program has lower participation because it's less convenient for the resident, but it's very affordable for the municipality to, to set up. So when, we're designing the programs with municipalities, we talk to them about what is the primary objective for the program. If it's maximum participation and maximum convenience, then fully subsidi subsidized curbside collection makes sense. If there's a limited budget and we just wanna try out a pilot that's gonna lead to broader participation over time, then probably a drop-off program would make sense. Next. So a few, a few case studies of these in action. So town of Chevy Chase was one of the first municipalities to start a curbside collection program in the region. And they started an opt-in program where the, the town paid for, for everything. 
And this slide's a, actually a couple years old now. They were over four or five years, they built up to 40% participation. Now they're likely closer to 50%. I haven't checked on the numbers recently. Next. City of Baltimore recently launched a food scrap drop-off program in the summer of 2021. So they selected five existing drop-off centers to include food waste. And they started with a grant and got very good early adoption and that program has been continuing and expanding. Next. Fairfax County, <clears throat> similarly, they launched a couple of food scrap drop-off programs and they located it at an existing transfer station and a landfill complex that's open to their county residents. So they located it right next to a, a glass recycling drop-off point, for example. And that's been going very well as well and, and very well as well and, and expanding. So tonnage has continued to um, grow over the past couple of years and it's helping the county meet its uh, zero waste targets with their, that they're building towards. Next. So I'll wrap up with both some, some tips and lessons learned for governments and for, for companies. So first for the governments, on the collection side, we like to follow the KISS model, right? Keep it simple and stupid. The best way to just get started if, if a municipality has never had a program before is go with a, a simple pilot um, or a similar contracting mechanism to really shortcut that two to three year sales cycle that other speakers have already talked about. And this helps, you know, a farmer, one of their motto is, is learn by doing. And that's a similar model that, or motto that I think municipalities can follow when they are launching food waste recycling programs for the first time. So don't try to overcomplicate things with a 40 page RFP to capture every single risk. I mean, we can start small, keep the budget to a size that allows you to do a pilot or something similar. And then inevitably, you'll learn and you'll grow from there. Particular, when, when you're doing a, a drop-off program or a curbside collection program, make it visible. Making it visible, promoting it on social media and other places allows it to grow, the, the participation to grow over time. And once residents start, they can't stop. And residents will become the people that inspire the programs to grow over time. So if county council members or mayor is, is uncertain about this program, they will hear the demand from the, the voter base that they want this composting to, to expand, but it has to start. So that's the most important thing. No matter you know, which community that we work with, there's always somebody who asks about rodents and smell so that's inevitably uh, a concern and you just have to get out ahead of that it's going to, the objection is going to come so you might as well get out ahead of it and you know we always remind people that we're not bringing new trash to these to these places you know the food the, the food waste has to go somewhere and food waste will go into a bin that is meant for organics and we haul that the the bins away on a regular basis and we s make sure to schedule the pickups based on the sensitivities of the municipality no i, I didn't realize i forgot to start my timer brenda um, on the composting infrastructure side i'll, I'll go fast on these i mean at a, at a very basic level zoning codes and other regulations need to differentiate composting from landfills and other types of waste management We've seen a lot of counties that don't even have composting in their definitions of, of the zoning code or the, or the permitting. Um, go to the next slide. The last thing I'll say on the, you know, some tips for composters and collectors, you know, collections just expect a very long development process, but you have to be prepared for when the RFP is, is finally released. So know your cost structure. Um, and then compost on the composting side, Get involved with industry groups to start paving the way for new laws and regulations 
so that you make your job easier down the road. So don't wait for someone else to speak up and lobby on your behalf, although we've all done that with ILS R and Brenda. But you know, get get involved with your communi communities and, and start the process now to pave the way for the next three years. So with that, you can go to the next slide with my contact info and I'll wrap up. Thanks, Ben. Couldn't agree more with a lot of those comments. And uh, I'm very lucky that I get to uh, work in Maryland with some of these folks, including our last speaker here, Justin Garrity, who's the president of Veteran Compost here in Maryland company he started also in 2010 and composting on a 30 acre farm in Aberdeen and his operations have expanded to other sites northern Virginia so I think a second site in Maryland I you've had some zoning wins some zoning challenges thanks for bringing up zoning Ben maybe we'll get to that um, Eileen has a lot of experience in zoning but Justin at veteran compost has several contracts with local governments to operate I think drop-off programs mostly in Annapolis, Baltimore, Falls Church in, in, in Maryland, and Falls Church in Virginia. So Justin, the mic is yours. Thanks. I like that picture of me. I look like a, a young ghost. I like that picture a lot. All right. Um, so what do I have? I probably have like negative five minutes to talk, Brenda. Or no, you, you have your talk? full ten minutes. Oh, well, that's good. generous. I'll be I'll be quick because no one wants to listen to me anyway. All right. So. Um, I'm Justin with Veteran Compost. We, as Brenda said, we operate a couple of facilities, um, two permanent facilities in Maryland, one that's operational, one that will probably be operational about 60 days, and one in um, Northern Virginia, um, in Alexandria, uh, right near Fort Belvoir. So we collect and also compost residential, commercial, and industrial materials, uh, food scraps, and, uh, and wood waste, and then also some manure at the new facility. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I just picked a couple of projects that I thought were interesting. We, we do some government work. Um, just to clarify up front, I'm not a, I'm not a big uh, political guy. So um, none of these comments, please don't take them as a political statement or that I'm some tinfoil hat guy. Always try to preface with that. But, you know, I would say when we look at working with government, we're always a little skeptical just based on over the last couple of years, the history we've had. So I'll get to it in a minute. Some lessons learned that I really wanted to share. Um, Mostly for the composters, I, I do like how Andrew had stuff for composters and municipalities. So for, if you're a municipality and are on this call, just understand that maybe some of the things I'm going to share later, um, you can chalk it up to cynicism or, or just lessons learned from, from being on the front lines. As you can see from wearing a, a gray t-shirt, I'm out, out here in the struggle making dirt every day. So um, in terms of food scrap drop-offs, I, I really do like doing food scrap drop-offs. I think if you are uh, in a municipality or you're a DPW manager or in the waste industry, this is a great way to buy you several years of time for a very low cost with your residents who want composting. So drop-offs are really cheap and easy to get going, minimal infrastructure. Uh, it makes all of your folks who are demanding composting be, be very happy that they have something and they probably won't be back for a couple of years to ask about curbside. So uh, I'm a big proponent of, of the drop-off sites. It's also, as a composter, really easy to just go to a drop-off site, pick up bins versus going to you know hundreds and thousands of houses in a municipality. Um, so we'll see pictures on them in a minute, but a couple of projects we've done, towns of all different sizes and, and, and shapes, um, Haverty Grace, Falls Church, Annapolis, and Baltimore. Um, and then two other projects uh, we'll see in a second, uh, a farmer's market program, uh, like was previously talked about, and then also uh, an interesting story about working with the federal government quickly uh, with the VA hospital dumpster. So let's go to the next slide. So these are pictures of a couple different things. Um, always like to see uh, a little bit of infrastructure and investment by the municipalities in terms of enclosures or signage helps to find the space, um, helps to avoid contamination, helps let people know that they're in the right place. Um, so in the upper left corner, that is in uh, the town of Haverty Grace, which is right where the Susquehanna River meets the Chesapeake Bay, cool little town. Um, and this is located right near uh, the public, um, a public park, uh, right near the downtown restaurant area, and also where they have the farmers market. And in, in Hartford County, where this is located in Maryland, this is the only uh, municipal drop-off site in the county. So they actually get um, a lot of foot traffic from people who drive here to drop off their food scraps and then stick around to have dinner, or stick around for the farmers market, or go shopping. And so that's like something we're working on is kind of. Um, putting together an article to talk about using drop-off sites as really a, a business generator, a way to get foot traffic. I mean, how much does your municipality or your town spend to try to advertise and promote the downtown area? Well, if you put something like this downtown, 
you get foot traffic, you get instant car traffic because people are coming here to drop off their food scraps and then they stick around. And so that's what this town has been really happy about is that the participation has been very high for a very small town um, in a town that's not a historically green town. And then they're seeing a lot of people at the restaurant and in the shops. Um, next to that in the upper right hand corner, we have the city of Falls Church. So city of Falls Church, um, very small town, um, but really, really good at uh, the drop-off program. We have 10 64 gallon bins for a town of just a couple thousand people because um, the actual city itself is pretty small. And this is right in between the rec center and the tennis courts and the city hall. So once again, a great location, uh, really easy for people to get in and out when they're stopping by the rec center or uh, when they're just passing through town. The signage is great um, using the, the um, some of those great um, food signs that are out there and freely available from the ad council. Um, and that program, just does great year after year. We really like working with City of Falls Church. Um, and then down in the lower left corner, an example maybe of what not to do, uh, City of Annapolis, the city uh, for this program, uh, the drop-off program was in, uh, was grant financed by a nonprofit, Annapolis Green, great group of ladies that are really passionate about trying to make things happen in Annapolis and move things forward. Um, we've been talking about drop-off in Annapolis for about eight years, took about eight years to get to this point to get some grant financing. The city um, gave them the worst real estate in town. It's in Truxton Park behind the skate park. And it's really difficult even for our drivers to find where the bins are. Um, and then they refuse to contribute any signage or any fencing. So, um, you know, it really makes a difference for municipalities when they really offer up a good location and some good infrastructure to, to make things happen. And we see that well, there's a lot lower participation in the lower left corner of those bins in a town, the city of Annapolis, our capital, they have less material in their bins than in the upper left corner, the town of Haver de Grace, a town that is a fraction of the size in a not historically green county. So, and then the bottom right corner is um, uh, city of Baltimore We in Patterson Park. We have several neighborhood associations that have bins just on, in, in areas for neighborhood associations and get really, really good uh, participation in those as well. So you can see the signage, very simple, located on a sidewalk near someone's house that was willing to host the bins and they get, we get thousands of pounds a week out of just this simple drop-off program that's promoted by the neighborhood association and they're really happy because now they have somewhere within their neighborhood to have the material handled go to the next slide um, we have the farmers market drop-off in fairfax county great program um, as was previously discussed farmers markets are really great for outreach and, and educating folks and, and we see good participation there and then finally um, we have on the right hand side here a dumpster from the va um, i'll talk about that in my lessons learned but um Kind of funny, kind of interesting that this dumpster comes to our facility, um, is hauled to us from, as part of a federal contract from the VA uh, Medical Center here. So this is all material coming out of, um, of, of a VA hospital nearby. So go to the next slide. These are the lessons learned. I see them at a couple minutes here. So we're gonna keep it short just so I wrap it up. Just understand as was previously discussed, the sales cycle is, is really long um, in this process. So if you're a composter, and you think this is going to happen fast, unless there's an RFP on the street, you're looking at um, a couple of months or years to make something happen. Um, like I said, the drop-off is a great way to try to speed things up, offer the drop-off as a quick and easy solution, um, but understand that this, this doesn't happen, and you might have to do a lot of education and things like that to, to get people. The one thing I'll say is we I've never sold composting service or compost a product to anyone who's not looking for it. So if people say, tell me about this composting, sell me on it, that's where I say, your town's probably not ready. And when you are ready, let me know and I'm happy to come back and work with you. And that's not me trying to be fresh or uh, short on time. It's just my job's not to really, you know, publicize and educate on composting. It's to help the people that are ready. So I would say in the sales cycle, if people are standoffish or they're not sure, don't waste your time because it's, it's not going to get to that process that Andrew talked about earlier where either in publicly or privately, it's going to get sunk. Um, I know some people have mentioned pilot projects are great. I would say be wary of pilot projects. All of the energy to start this is in the beginning. And so you put all of this energy into all the coordination meetings, all of the rollout, the delivery of the bins, the signage, working and educating people, overcoming all the roadblocks. And then 90 days later or a year later, another hauler gets the bid. Like that is a bummer. So if something is short-term pilot or it doesn't isn't renewable, that's really not an RFP that we're interested in because we're going to do all the legwork to get this thing going. And then you guys are going to pull up stakes on us as a municipality. I'm all good on that. So if you're a composter, be wary of pilot projects. H how does this become long-term? How am I guaranteed this is going to keep going? Um, in the case of Annapolis, we did a, it was a pilot. The city published a, a 
press release and asked us to publicize it on their behalf, which we did, that the pilot was continuing. And then a week later said, we're continuing the pilot. You're not part of it. Come pick your bleep up and get it out of here. And the bins were handed off to another hauler. So we were like completely sideswiped by that, which is kind of my last bullet point you'll see there. Be prepared for things to end at any time. Um, you know, we love the municipalities we work with, um, but the city of Annapolis project for us was a real eye opener with how fast um, a pilot can end or how fast you know the rug can get pulled on you uh, be very helpful if you're a composter in, in getting people if they are looking for answers but don't do unpaid consulting i can't tell you how many times in federal jobs people have brought us in for multiple meetings and asked us to help them design rfps um, and it goes on and on and on and you're, at some point you have to be able to stand up and say i'm happy to help you but at some point i gotta have billable hours because in some cases in federal municipal contracts people want to use you as much as possible to, to pump for information um, and at some point you gotta be able to say, well, well where's the, the project here? Or where's the consulting fee? Um, at the same time, be prepared for things to go to RFP. We have helped people write the RFP um, or write the contract and then seen it go out on the street. And in the case of the VA dumpster, the, the funny thing is, is I spent two years and several meetings at the VA hospital helping them get the project up and running. They put the RFP out, the RFP was written for us. We didn't win it. It went to not veteran compost, a veteran owned business. It went to some random, broker out of Delaware. And then they called us a week later and said, can we drop this dumpster off? So now we, there's a middleman involved. We lost the contract. So don't go do an unpaid consulting and be prepared to lose the RFP and understand that the lowest cost always wins. On a recent RFP for a government contract, we were told money doesn't matter. We want the best service possible. And we didn't win. And when we went back to them, they said, well, your price was too high. So unless you're ready to compete on cost, understand that cost is what is generally going to drive uh, how government contracts go. And then finally, make sure you're making real money on these projects. Do not factor goodwill, marketing, advertising, fun or, or, or help or anything like that from the government into your, your contracts. Diesel $6 a gallon, gasoline's $5 a gallon. Labor's getting more expensive every year. It's up 30% a year for us. So when you bid these as a composter, especially if you're a small community composter, make sure you bid this to be financially sustainable. Because if you're not financially sustainable, you won't be very long, around very long to help being the world be environmentally sustainable. So with that, I'm at 10 minutes, I'll yield, and uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Justin. All right, lots of uh, good fodder here for our discussion. If all of the presenters could turn your video cams on, and um, we have lots of questions. So I'm gonna try something with um, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna try a lightning round of questions since we have so many. Let's just see if this will work. So. Uh, I'll call you out, but it's like, yes, no, you can do maybe, and it depends. Okay, I'll let you do it. Andrew and Jeremy, I don't see you yet, so um, hopefully you're joined. Okay, so. Oh, I'm working on it. Okay. There we so, go. Uh, the big question for municipalities is, will this reduce our cost for disposal? So, no. um, I'm, <laughs> Eileen says no. <laughs> ben. Oh, you're muted, Ben. Unmute. Sorry. Sorry. Depends. Depends. Justin, will this reduce? Depends. Or... Depends. Uh, Andrew. Yes, if you have in-town processing. Jeremy. Long-term, yes. Short-term, no. Okay. Um, uh, have any of you worked with municipalities that run their own solid waste operations department? Um, we'll go in the same order. Eileen? No. No. Jeremy, you wanted to go? Yeah, our very first municipal program was with the town of University Park, Maryland. It had about 900 people. The, the expectation going in was we were going to set it up, we were going to run it for some period, a year, two years, and explicitly we were going to hand it off to their DPW to run our playbook. Um, I checked in with that manager. We did that program in 2011. Mickey Beal in University Park, if you've ever met the DPW guy there. Anyway, they are they now have somewhere between 45 and 50 percent participation. The town handles it themselves. They process it at MES, which is a, a you know large regional um, facility in Prince George's County, and it's a huge success. And they do it without any incremental cost to the city because they took out a trash room. Okay, that was helpful to have that information. But lightning round, it's yes, no, oh, maybe. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, I misunderstood. My fault. I, I, I misunderstood. Okay, I misunderstood. So I apologize. Can, I, I'm just that was the get... short answer, Brenda. That was the short Jeremy answer. Yeah. Oh, don't be like that. <laughs> Hi, Justin. Worked with? Have you worked with municipalities that run oh, their really own solid? 
Yes, we have. Uh, ben. Yes, we have. All right, Andrew. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, well, maybe we'll dive more. Jeremy, thanks really for getting us started on that. No, no, no. Sorry about but those, I think you all, maybe Andrew, you might be the exception, are running drop-off sites. So this, we had a lot of questions yeah, yeah. on drop-off sites. So this one, I'm just going to add to the yes, no, uh, the lightning round. Excuse me. Are there drop-off sites attended? Jeremy, I know your answer is yes. You showed us that yeah. for farmers markets. So that's yes. Eileen. Sometimes. Sometimes. Justin. Farmers market, yes. Municipal drop off unsupervised. Ben. Same. Okay. Andrew, do you do drop offs? Yes, we do. Uh, for municipal ones, unsupervised. For events, usually there's volunteers. Okay. I'm going to just get out of the. Well, oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to ask one more lightning round question. Are there concerns? Are, let, let me. I'm going to ask this just the way it was written. Are concerns about contamination on drop off stations warranted? So, uh, Eileen. Yes, and education is required to avoid that, I would say. Ben? It's right to be concerned, but if you design it right, it's much less than you think. Justin? Yeah, I would say it's less than curbside because you actually got to go to the place and drop your stuff off, so you're probably committed to being a nice person. Oh. I like that. Andrew? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Events need volunteers, and municipal sites, they're generally locked or behind a gate. Jeremy? Yeah. They're warranted. Yeah, okay. 100%. All right. All right. Um, do you agree that direct funding, such as via contracts, is the most important strategy for local government to support businesses like yours? I'm going to go reverse. So again, direct funding, such as via contracts, do you think, maybe let's not just say the most important strategy, but among one of the most important strategies. Jeremy. Yeah, money talks, full stop. Money talks. Andrew. Uh, we're in 80 communities and only three are direct funded. Do you think it's critical though, the direct funding in some way? We're in 77 other communities that aren't direct funded. Okay, Justin. Uh, leaving us alone would be the best thing to do, but I'll take money as the secondary thing. Okay, Ben. <laughs> Long-term revenue contracts are really important. I mean, it, it does in attract, especially if you're trying to attract debt and equity investors, they're always looking for long-term revenue contracts. Eileen? Yeah, I would agree with Ben. Um, I think also though that it's not always required. It's certainly helpful and certainly very attractive to the collection company. Okay. And then um, should, I think some of you mentioned just the, uh, Jeremy, you started us off on this, just the importance of writing RFPs to favor small, you know, whether it's small business operators or keeping the product local. Um, so should contract, mm -hmm. RFPs be written to favor small business operators like yourselves. And I'll, we'll just go back in this round the same way. Eileen? You know, it's going to be based on the municipalities, you know, what their goals and objectives are. I would say that's lovely and I would love that, but I'm not sure that that's realistic in a lot of communities. Ben, any thoughts on RFPs? Yeah, two, two main quick thoughts. So one is you have to think about, you know, companies like veterans and compost cab and black earth who've been around for a decade doing this if you don't give them an incentive to win a contract then are you promoting entrepreneurship and environmental entrepreneurship mm -hmm. so you don't want to disincentivize on entrepreneur you know environmental entrepreneurship um and i lost a second point so we can continue all right justin I think, RFPs. It's tough. I think it's tough to do um, to to make your you know satisfy your citizens your job as a municipality to serve them a service at a fair price because um, I mean for like combined curbside that's going to go really low price bidders I mean look at Arlington County Virginia who's doing that contract not a community composter right and that was a big big contract that went to the cheapest price so I think uh, it's tough to do as a municipality and still meet the goals of giving citizens prices at a services at a fair price. Andrew, your thoughts? Uh, conflict of interest, I'd say yes, but 
I think it's it'd be hard to incentivize them, like what Justin said, but you should be careful not to disincentivize them. And what I was saying, you know, for a collections RFP, leave it open for creative ideas, like in town processing or just other ideas that aren't just the straight and narrow, you will pick up from every household this day of the week. Like, leave it broad and you'll be amazed what we get. Jeremy, I know you started off this dialogue yeah, on the RFP, but, so. I mean, I think it is, it's, I don't think it necessarily needs to be bound by composting. When I was talking about creating a structural benefit for small and, and local businesses, that, you know, in, in the district, the way that happens is through the Department of Small and Local Business Development. And so if you get registered as a certified business enterprise, if you're a long-term resident, if you, you know, X, if you hit X, Y, and Z markets, if you're a veteran-owned business, if you're a um, a, a, if you're a, a person of color, like there's a whole long list of things that get you certain number of preferential points and they are intended to incentivize the kind of businesses that ostensibly the city wants to see. So when, and it only benefits you for the purposes of municipal procurement, but every time I go in and bid for a DC contract, I've got a 12 point preference over anybody else. And that's because we're based here and we've been here for a long time. And that's the case, whether it's a composting contract or a consulting contract, you name it. It's because I'm what's called a CBE, a certified business enterprise. Well, but it only, works in, it only works in DC. Eileen? It doesn't, yeah, doesn't your organization, you know, local is sustainable, it's regenerative, it generates local jobs, local jobs create money that's put back in the community. So again, that's what I'm saying is that if your community really thinks about the environmental impacts, and bringing in trucks from all over from a giant company. You've got to balance all that out, but it takes a very thoughtful community to do that. Um, so. Yeah, and um, Brenda, yeah. if I may, I, I remember my second point. So the, the, um, the RFPs that I think are not good for food waste recycling, because it's new for many municipalities and companies like ours have been doing this for a decade. We know what works and what doesn't work. And food waste recycling is different than other services. Mm -hmm. We want it to we want to do it right. We want to minimize contamination. We want clean feedstocks to make high quality compost. So RFPs that are only about price mm -hmm. are not good. RFPs like like Jeremy was talking about are others that have a point scale. So what is your, you know, are you a local business? Do you have experience doing this? And you get points based on a lot of things price is one of them, that gives a municipality more latitude to, to, pick, to pick a winning bidder that can provide this service at a high quality and a, a relatively low price. So just like we're a public benefit corporation, we have more than just a fiduciary duty to our shareholders and to earn the maximum profit. We want to earn a profit, but we have to do other things. RFP should accomplish the same thing. Mm -hmm. Justin, I know you were trying to get in here. Yeah, the, the one thing I forgot to mention, these are all great points, is one thing that'll scare off franchise haulers or maybe help towns accomplish the objective without is is if you specify that the, the hauler needs to provide proof that the material went to a <laughs> compost facility. Yeah. So if you true. ask someone to do that, a lot of people are gonna walk away from your RFP that are, are, are shady because a lot of people don't document where they go. Like here in Maryland, you don't have to actually take it to a compost facility after you pick it up. You can take it wherever you want. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we should do that with our recyclables too. Um, <laughs> uh, we had a question, and I think Justin, you you kind of sort of answer this a little bit in your remarks, but it came in actually before you spoke. How do you? This is for everybody. How do you identify which municipalities to work with? Do, and we're out of the lightning round, obviously. Do they come to you, or do you identify ideal partners? And if the latter, what is your criteria? And Justin, I'm going to start with you since you, if you want to add to anything you already shared. You know. I mean, I guess like a lot of folks on this panel, like if you've been around for a while, maybe people find you either because they know you from events or or through Google. Um, so, I mean, we if we see RFPs or they're sent to us, we'll certainly pursue them. We're on some of the different portals for state and municipal contracts um, where we hear about them through other means. So I don't have like a specific way. Maybe other folks do. But I'd say either people reach out to us or if we come across it through one of the portals or, or listservs or something like that. Um, but like off the street cold calling, I don't know that we do that. Um, like reaching out to municipalities, maybe other folks do and have have experience with that. Yeah, and Ben, I know I've he been hearing your your radio ads 
on the local radio station. Has that helped you get any any towns contacting you? So we so what Brenda's referring to is we um, put out an ad on NPR. Um, and I mean, it's 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 hard to say. I mean, we, you know, but it it's definitely um, uh, generated a lot of goodwill. There's no doubt about that. Any thoughts on how you identify which you know local governments you're working with, Ben? And then Andrew, I'll go to you. Yeah, I mean, we're, ultimately we're a uh, you know we're based in the Washington D.C. metro region, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, and there's a diverse group of municipalities that are all striving for um, to increase their diversion object their diversion rates and and try to get to zero waste and. I think you know. I've, I saw a stat: 98% of municipalities across the nation don't have food waste recycling programs or consistent food waste recycling programs set up. So, I mean, I think start close to home because there's most most likely your municipality is is struggling with with food waste recycling or their landfill is going to run out of room soon. And Andrew, you're in a state, Massachusetts, that I think was one of the first states to ban food waste from disposal. So I can only imagine how that helped you get some of your contracts. Anything you want to add to this? Uh, yes, it definitely helped. Uh, Massachusetts was first in the nation in 2014, and, and that has helped. And their plan is at the earliest 2030, the ban extends to the residential level. So um, we work with municipalities that come to us because it's hard to convince a municipality otherwise and realize that the municipalities that do come to us are first movers and they're going to be ahead of the curve because mm -hmm. when 2030 hits um, you don't want to be the town who's calling around to waste management and republic all at the same time asking for quotes on pickup service you know you want to be the municipality who already has had it running since 2025 yeah and brenda we yeah. we wait for communities to come to us um because again just as andrew said it, going out and trying to sell somebody on a program that's it's too hard new york and new jersey are both mandating uh compost for larger um um producers so they're and they have a pecking order so both those communities um you know both those states are mandating so that should you know increase some um you know facilities growth hopefully and you know encourage maybe some new facilities and maybe some new haulers so we have tons of questions but three minutes left so we're going to end on time uh there's one question would the recording be available the answer is yes we will send everybody who registered mm -hmm. uh the link to the recording um and uh I have been focusing on questions that have to do with the topic at hand as community uh, local government support for community composting and these uh, small operators that we're featuring here today. So uh, there's been lots of questions on, uh, you know, how can farm compost, you know, for those of you who compost on farms, how did you overcome contamination concerns with farm sit soils? But I'm staying away from asking all the questions because we just don't have time. But I'm going to end with one on zoning because that is another issue where, you know, as they say, all zoning is local. And I know in talking earlier with this group, you know, we could have a whole webinar just on zoning. But if we could go through, and again, you have really 30 seconds each to wrap up here, um, just really quick, just your thoughts on zoning and what local government could be doing to make your operations easier. And Justin, I'm going to start with you since you had a recent <laughs> zoning battle. <laughs> yeah, eight years running, five years, yeah, eight years running, we, we've, I think, are getting to the finish line. So I think zoning is a, is the biggest challenge to composting, or it's my top three. And so if you're a municipality, and I'm sure Andrew can speak to this as, as has worked in a lot of municipalities, is, um, yeah, it's probably one of the biggest barriers to composting. And it's probably a bigger barrier than money. I can go get money somewhere, but zoning is probably the biggest challenge to, to our industry is land availability and zoning. Eileen, I know you worked on zoning in your planning local government hats. Yeah, I still do. Um, so, and I'm also working on it with U.S. Composting Council. So zoning, you know, also costs money. So the eight-year battle that Justin had, you know, besides, you know, like you said, it's a bigger impediment than money. It just dribbles away your resources and your energy at any given point. Um, so I think, you know, with municipalities, certainly having 
when it's uh, permitted um, by your state regulators, DEP, DEC, whatever the an acronym or initials are for your, you know, um, I think that definitions, you, the community needs to have definitions. They need to understand what composting is about um, in order to then set it up properly and design it properly. And if there's farms around, these things can be designed really nicely on farms in rural communities and even in urban areas if they're if they're designed properly and they're scaled properly. You know, we don't need the biggest facility. You know, everybody big helps financially, but it doesn't help um, with a decentralized model and it doesn't help. It brings in all the other issues relative to a very large site. So I think uh, municipalities really need to you know, get their uh, zoning in place and they need to find their expert, their local planner should be able to help them do that, but also try to be forgiving because as Justin said, you know, the worst fear as a person who operates and been at thousands of meetings, I don't want to go before a planning or zoning board. And I know all of the ins and outs. I've been to literally thousands of land use meetings and I don't want to go. So if I don't want to go, then, you know, and that just and that just goes and demonstrates how difficult a process it is. So I think municipalities really need to work with their composters, um, okay. you know, to make that happen. Yep. I lied. We're going to be one minute over. But Ben, yeah. I know you had a win on zoning on on-farm composting. So anything you want to say on that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, very briefly. The, the, what I'd say br very briefly is that regulators and lawmakers, um, both from a permitting perspective and zoning perspective, need to remember that number one, composting is not landfilling, so they need to differentiate. And number two, community composting and on-farm composting is not centralized composting, so the risks are are much different, and the permits and zoning need to treat it as such. Clearly, folks, we need more time, um, but I there was nobody I would have you know cut, and there were other people to add, so we will be doing having more discussions, join us for the next one. There's going to be a survey that's going to pop up for all of you. Um, and it's all voluntary. And so we welcome that feedback on the audiences we're reaching and your thoughts. So please participate in that. And thank you to my panel. You guys were amazing. And good luck with your businesses. And Thanks, uh, we look forward to supporting you. Thank you, Brenda. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks Clarissa. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Clarissa. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thanks, Clarissa. Thank you. Bye.